you have your Bible with you this morning, I hope you're going to take some notes or maybe I can get you some later because I've got a lot of scripture to give you, but our main text this morning, our foundation of scriptures, will be found in Luke, the 16th chapter. I studied throughout the week, of course, and prayed for the mind of the Lord like I always do. And until 8 o'clock this morning when my eyes opened, I knew what I was going to preach. Hallelujah. But as soon as my eyes opened this morning, the Holy Spirit spoke something different to me. And I can tell you this morning before I start that no matter how good I think I do or no matter how bad of a job I do, I will walk away thinking that I could have done better. I will tell you this morning that no matter how much I work for him and no matter how much I do, I will leave this life thinking, God, I could have done more. As we know, Halloween's three days away, and we're not going to talk about Halloween this morning, but one of the things we talked about last week about Halloween was how that it promotes fear. And throughout this last month, I've seen advertisements for haunted houses and for uh, horror houses and for all of those things. And no doubt at their Halloween parties and bonfires, they will gather around and tell ghost stories. And even some of the places that I saw that were haunted houses were advertised by churches. Amen. Things they call houses of horror. I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning, if the Holy Spirit will allow me to do so. I want to tell you a ghost story. I want to tell you about a real account. I want to tell you about a real house of horrors this morning. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you see, nothing that man can come up with, I don't care how, care how scary the haunted house is that you went through or how scary it is that you go through, nothing that man can come up with can compare to this house of horrors. Nothing that man can even imagine in his most diabolical thoughts can compare. You know how the Bible says that when it talks of heaven, it says that I have not seen and ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. The same can be said of hell. This morning, it doesn't matter. The most gruesome and terrible thought that you can have does not scratch the surface of how terrible hell is is. Amen. And hell is eternal. <clears throat> so this morning I want to tell you a real true life ghost story. I want to tell you this morning about a house of horrors. And trust me, I take absolutely no joy whatsoever preaching on this. I would much rather be preaching about heaven this morning and the joys that await us there, but I would be neglectful in my duty as a minister of the gospel if I told you and spoke to you of the glories of heaven, but I didn't warn you of the fires of hell. Amen? Amen. So we're going to go this morning to Luke, the 16th chapter, in the 19th verse. That's where we're going to start. <clears throat> and like I said, I've seen advertisements for horror movies, and I've seen... Uh, people on Facebook talking about going to haunted houses and going to see the latest horror flick. And someone told us last night that her daughter and her husband had had plans last night to hit three haunted houses all in one night. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I want to tell you a scary story this morning. You see, a lot of times the people, they do that because they like to be scared. But one of the reasons they do that is because they can be scared. They'll go in the front door, they'll be scared, but they'll come out the back and it's over. The house of horrors that I want to talk to you about this morning never ends. There is no going in and coming back out. If you go in, you will stay there forever and forever and forever. Say, preacher, you're trying to scare me. Listen, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you need to be scared. Listen to me, church. The lost are one breath, one heartbeat away from spending eternity 
in a devil's hell. So if you're out there today under the sound of my voice and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you should be scared today. Because if your next breath is your last, if your next heartbeat is your last, you will go to this house of horrors that I'm talking about this morning. And the same fate awaits you that awaits you, that awaits this man that we're going to read about in Luke, the 16th chapter. And you'll have to bear with me this morning. I feel the burden of the Lord. I have since I got up at 8 o'clock this morning for this message. And I know there are other preachers that could do a better job of it than me, but sadly most of them won't preach on this. I know there are preachers that are smarter than me, that have more education than I do, Brother Jim, but sadly most of them will not preach on this. Amen? That's true. A, uh, on a news show that I watched some time ago, and I'm not picking on Joel Osteen, but I have to use him because he's the best example I got. Out of all the thousands that tune in to him, out of all the thousands that goes to his church, this interviewer asked him, said, what about hell? You don't preach on hell, do you? And he said, no. That's not my calling. My answer to him and any other preacher that feels that way this morning, and I would say that if that's not your calling, then you're not called. That's right. If that's not your calling, then you are not called today. Amen? If you're only going to tell people of heaven, if you're only going to tell people of good things, if you're only going to appease people's minds and conscience, if you're only going to scratch their ears, you'd be better off and they'd be better off. If you went somewhere else and did something else other than claiming to be a preacher of the gospel because the gospel includes this. Warning people of hell. Amen. Now I want you to know this this morning. That this is not a parable. Amen. This is not a parable. I had a discussion this past week with someone who said that someone that was talking to them thought that this was a parable. At least that's what they thought that these people were trying to get across to them or said to them. This is not a parable. This is an actual story. This is something Jesus was telling, an actual account. Amen? And we know this because several reasons, but I'll give you a couple of them. The parables that Jesus used, he always used an example that our carnal mind could understand, a picture that he would draw with something earthly that we could understand. And he would say things like, the kingdom of heaven is like this. He would say, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man who went on a certain journey. Or he would say, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man who had a great supper. You understand what I'm saying? It's much like if we give a demonstration or tell a story while we're preaching to try and get you to see a visual picture of something we can understand. But Jesus doesn't give that here. He doesn't start out with that the kingdom of heaven is like this or that this is an example. This is not an example. This is a true story that Jesus told. A true account. This is a real ghost story this morning. Amen. This is a real house of horrors that never ends so we know that it's not a parable because it's not laid out like a parable. Another reason we know that it is not a parable is because in every parable that Jesus ever gave, he never gave the people in the parable a name. He does in this account here. Amen? He does in this. I'm going to try my best to stay with my notes as much as possible because I don't want to keep you all morning. Hallelujah. But he gives the beggar's name, and we'll see that in just a minute. If you're out there this morning and you don't know Jesus and you like ghost stories and you like to be scared, then this one should scare you spitless. Amen? This should scare you. And hopefully, some saved people that hear it, it will cause them to think enough about hell and the things and the fiery torments of hell that it will cause them to get a burden which most of the church world does not have. Most of the church world does not have a burden for the lost. It would be a shame. It would be, it would shame us all if I asked how many how much time we spend praying for the lost, especially the, the, the entire church body. Amen. Sadly, most churches don't even have an altar anymore. And I know you don't have to have one. Don't hurt anything, though. Amen. Doesn't hurt anything. But listen to this. Luke, the 16th chapter, beginning in the 19th verse. Jesus speaking these words. 
There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. Like I told you, this gives the beggar's name. Jesus didn't do that with parables. Amen? Jesus didn't do that with parables. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, the Lord is giving us a perfect example, perfect example of the death of one who has put their faith and trust in God and his way of salvation and the death of one who has not. And I want you to notice here that neither one of them also had this discussion this past week with someone because this had been brought up in some of their conversations, their Bible studies. There are people who believe that whenever you die and you go to the grave that you stay there, your soul stays there, called soul sleep, or however they've said it, Brother Jim, I'm sure you've heard of it, but that you stay there asleep until the resurrection. This one, this one, these, these few passages of Scripture debunk that whole thought. The rich man did not stay in the grave. His body did. Amen? Lazarus the beggar didn't stay in the grave or wherever he was put. His body did, but his soul and spirit, the 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 beggar went to Abraham's bosom. The rich man, the Bible says, was buried. And what's it say next? It says that and in hell he lift up his eyes. Now this can't be the grave because it doesn't stop there. Some people say, well that just means that he was died and he was buried and hell has to do with just being in the grave. That's not what it says. And in hell he lift up his eyes. He could see being in torments, not just one, but many torments. There are many torments to hell today. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Amen. That alone is enough to tell us today what happens when you die. If you're born again, if you have your faith in Jesus, like the apostle Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But if you do not know Jesus, if you, do, if you have not accepted God's plan, His way of salvation, you will die and you will leave this world and instantaneously you will wake up. You will lift up your eyes in hell like this rich man lifted up his eyes in hell. Amen. Say, Brother Billy, I, I don't want to think about hell. I don't, I don't like talking about hell. I don't like talking about it either. I don't like thinking about it either. But we have to, we must, we must preach that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shine today that the fires of hell have not been quenched. This was, this was 2,000 years ago that Jesus was telling this story. We don't know how far it had been from the time it actually took place that Jesus told it. But today, all these thousands of years later, this same rich man is still in torment today in the fiery pits of the damned because hell is eternal this house of horrors does not end. Amen? It's forever and forever and forever and forever. Listen to what it says. In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, to see if Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So we know he had sight. So not only could he feel the flames and the torments that we'll talk about in a minute, but he could see. I believe he could see those that were around him, that were being tormented. Amen. We will find that in hell, this rich man had all five senses. Amen. And not only that, I believe that his senses were heightened. I believe they were. I don't think that, I don't think that they were, that his hearing was dull, that his eyes were dim. I believe that he felt every bit and still to this day feels every bit of the torment and sees clearly, hallelujah, everything around him. Uh, listen to what it says, verse 24. And he cried. You see, hell is a place of crying. As a matter of fact, the Bible says weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. Nothing that we could even imagine would come close to the cries of torment that are there in this place. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me 
and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You see, one of the torments of, of this place, one of the torments of hell is an unquenchable thirst. An unquenchable thirst. Has anyone, anyone I know you have. If you've lived very long, you've been so thirsty that it seemed like your throat was sticking together. That your tongue cl clave to the, to the roof of your mouth. That, that you just couldn't even hardly swallow because your mouth was so dry. One of the torments of hell is an unquenchable thirst. You see, there's no water in hell. There's no relief in hell. Amen. Hallelujah. There's no relief in hell. He said that, would you have him come and dip his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. You see, there's no preference or no prejudice in hell. This rich man had laid, this uh, beggar had laid at this rich man's gate day after day day after day, and he walked right on past him. Probably wouldn't have touched him with a 10-foot pole. Amen? One of the things is that thought. The re one of the reasons this was such a slap into the face of the Jewish people he was telling this to is because they believed if you was poor and if you was sick, you wasn't right with God. You were cursed. But that if you were rich and you were being blessed financially, that had to mean you must be right in the sight of God. But here we have Jesus saying it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with status. It has nothing to do with you, but it has all to do with him. The rich man dies, and according to the Jewish way of thinking, and those Pharisees and Sadducees, they would have thought, well, he's going to go to heaven. But the rich man goes to hell. And now he's not so picky about this beggar. As a matter of fact, he said, I don't care if he even takes his... Filthy old dirty hands that I wouldn't have touched in the life before with a 10-foot pole. Would you just have him dip his finger in water and come and let him touch my tongue with it? That's the kind of unquenchable, uncontrollable thirst there is in this torment, the torment of this unquenchable thirst in hell. Listen to this. But Abraham said, Son, remember. Now here's another torment. But remember... Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things, and now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Another, another torment of hell is memory. Amen. We'll find out in a minute just how well he did remember. But I believe, see, here in this life, a lot of times I'd be like, oh man, I forgot. In hell, I believe that your memory will be precise. Same way in heaven, I believe the same thing in heaven. I believe that if this rich man in hell remembered that he had family on earth, I believe you remember that when you're in heaven. Why wouldn't you? Amen? He said, remember, so memory is one of the torments of hell. You'll remember the life that you lived. You will remember the opportunity that you had to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you did not do it. I believe today that you will remember every altar call that you ever sat through and did not respond to the wooing and the operation of the Holy Spirit to convict your heart. I believe today that you will remember every word of every preacher that you ever heard. I believe you remember the sermon that you shut off because you didn't want to hear about Jesus and you didn't want to hear about hell. I believe you'll remember those things. Amen. Because you'll remember your life on earth and you'll remember those times. And no doubt you will have regrets like we can't even imagine regrets. Why didn't I accept him? Why didn't I choose God's way before it was eternally too late for me? Amen. So one of the torments in hell is memory. You will remember the life you lived, the opportunity you had to accept God. You will remember the words of the preacher. You will remember the altar calls. You will remember this sermon this morning of that preacher who talked about hell. Amen. You will remember. So the, the torments of hell, hallelujah, your five senses will be heightened, I believe, and I believe that it will be a torment to hear. 
Anybody ever you heard something that was just so terrible that you just wanted to plug your ears and just not hear it anymore? Can't do that in hell. You'll be able to hear. Amen. Hallelujah. No doubt if you can close your eyes, you'll still see the flames and the torment of those around you. This also leads me to believe that if you can talk, if you can hear, if you can see, if you can touch, that you can probably also smell. Talking about a house of horrors this morning. What else did he say here? See, he said, uh, remember in thy lifetime that, that uh, how thou receivest the good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted. That lets us know this morning that the rich man was not comforted. That means he had no rest. That's another torment of hell this morning. No rest. You see, we get this picture, we think it's just flames. A lot of people think that whenever someone goes to hell, they're just burned up and that's it. It's, it's over. That they, It just destroys them. And, and it doesn't last forever and forever. But we see from this, there are many torments of hell. There are many facets of this house of horrors that we're talking about this morning. Amen? There will, there will be no rest in hell. Listen to what it says in verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that so that they which would pass from thence, from hence to you, to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Here's another torment of hell. There is no escape from hell. Amen. All hope of uh, surely someone will come and get us out of this place. All hope of that is gone. Amen. There's no escape. It's like being in prison with no hope of ever getting out. It's like being, and, and, and that's, a, that's a small comparison. It's like being in a burning building where the fire will not go out, where you will not die, and you cannot escape the tormenting flames of this terrible place. There is no escape from hell. Verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Listen, this is his memory again. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So we see here also that there is a torment of helplessness. He knew where he was. He knew why he was there. He didn't blame nobody. Amen. He didn't blame anybody. You might say, well, how does God send somebody to hell? I guarantee you those that are in hell today do not blame God. This rich man knew exactly why he was there. He knew where he was at. He never asked where he was at, and he never blamed anybody else for him being there. He got there himself, and he knew it. And he felt helpless because he could not warn his family not to come to this awful place. So he asked Abraham, would you send somebody? Send somebody to warn my family. Hell's cries come out from the pits of the damned today to the church. Will you please tell somebody not to come to this awful place? Will you preach not only about heaven, but tell them about hell. Tell them about this tormenting place where I'm at today. The cries of this rich man still cry from the pits of the damned and should ring in the ears of the church. Tell somebody not to come to this terrible place. Tell them how they don't have to come to hell. Amen. So he was helpless to help his family. Can you imagine standing by knowing that danger and destruction awaits those that you cherish and love the most just around the corner? But regardless of how much you scream, they can't hear you. And regardless of how much you move, they can't, they can't see you. Regardless of what you do, there is absolutely nothing you can do to help them. And this rich man begs, please send somebody. The cry from hell today is still, Lord, is still God send somebody to tell them not to come to this awful place. Amen. That's the church's job. And he said go into all the world, go into all the world and build big churches. No, that's not what he said. Go into all the world and build some theme parks so Christians can have some relaxation and some fun time. No, that's not what he said. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Go into all the world and preach the message of the cross. Go into all the world and warn them. There, yes, there's a heaven to gain. It's a wonderful place. But the fires of hell still burn today and await all of those that reject Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. There are Jews in hell. Amen. 
At least there were Jews in this life. They're not Jews there now. Amen. There are Jews in hell. But Brother Billy Wade, they were God's people. Yes, they were. God chose them and he did a great work through them. They brought us the word of God and they brought Jesus Christ through the lineage there. But all of them that rejected Jesus as Messiah and have died went to a devil's hell. It doesn't matter what John Hagee says. It doesn't matter what what anybody what the, uh, the the gospel of inclusion says. If you reject Jesus Christ, it don't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Muslim. It doesn't matter if you're a Catholic, a Pentecostal, Presbyterian, or a Baptist. If you do not accept Jesus Christ and the blood that He shed on Calvary, you go to hell forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. You see, just as there's only two places to go, heaven and hell, there's only one way to get to heaven, and there's really only one way to get to hell. The only way to get to heaven is by receiving what God has done on the cross of Calvary, what Jesus Christ has done. The only way to go to hell is to reject that. Amen? To reject God's plan and to choose your own. So there are all kinds, nationalities, colors and creeds, beliefs that end up in hell. There's no atheist there. They were in this life. They're no longer an atheist now. Amen. They believe now. So he felt helpless. He said, my family's going to come here and ain't nothing I can do to stop it. He remembered that. Amen. Uh, I have five brethren. Send somebody to testify. And listen to what verse 29 says. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have the word. Let them hear that. They have the church. Let them hear that. That would be his answer today to those. Because they would not believe if one came from the dead. What did they try to do to Lazarus, uh, Mary Martha's brother, after Jesus raised him from the dead? Try to kill him. So they wouldn't believe if one would come from the dead. Besides, they have the church. But Brother Billy, what if somebody dies without hearing about Jesus? That ain't on God, that's on you. That's on the church. Amen. He gave us the great commission to fulfill the great commission. And the church is too busy playing tiddlywinks and, and, and being so worldly that they're no, they're no heavenly good. and So much like the world that they can't be a witness to the world because the world don't see any difference in them than what they have. Amen. So he said they have the prophets. Moses and the prophet, let them hear them. They have the scripture today. They have the church today. They're supposed to have us today. Amen. This man was crying in hell then. He's crying in hell today. Please, God, send somebody to go and tell them. I wish the church could hear that ringing in their ear and in their heart this morning. Go and tell them. Do what you can do. Support the gospel in any way whatsoever that you can. Verse 30. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I want to make this clear this morning. I want to make this point that there is only two places that you will spend eternity. One of them is heaven and one of them is hell. Amen. And I want to make this other point, which I mentioned a while ago, but I'll tell you again, that there's only one way to get to heaven, and that way is not Muhammad, it is not Allah, hallelujah, it is not Buddha, it is Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So when you're sat down, preacher, in front of a TV camera and someone asks you, what about Jews, what about Muslims, what about atheists, what about those who don't accept Christ? And you sit there and say, and they say, are they going to go to hell? And you sit there and say, well, I can't say that. Jesus has already settled that question. Amen. You accept him and go to heaven or you reject him and you die lost and go to hell. Amen. Later they asked that preacher who before millions when asked what about the Jew? What about the Muslim? What about those that are atheists? What about those that don't believe in God? Will they go to hell? And he said well I wouldn't say that. Later that minister said he wasn't ready for that question. If you're not ready for that question you're not ready to preach. Amen. If you're not ready for that question you are not ready to preach. We're talking about the house of horrors this morning. Amen. The real 
house of horrors this morning. I want to give you some other scriptures. You can write them down if you're taking notes. I'm going to hit them pretty fast. Hallelujah. This is the way to escape going to this eternal place of torment. Six, Mark 16 and 16. He that believeth and is baptized, talking about believing in Jesus, shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. And of course, John, the third chapter, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen to me. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not, believeth not what? In him. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Is that clear enough for the church this morning? Amen. Is that clear for, enough for us to know that we cannot join hands with other faiths that say that you can get there by your works or you can get there by Buddha or you can get there by Allah or you can get there by Muhammad or that you can get there by counting your beads or that you can get there because my priest will, will take your sins before God. Jesus made it really plain, Brother Tyler, when he said, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath, he hath not believed in the name of the the only begotten Son of God. Only two ways to go this morning, heaven or hell. Amen? There was a message one man left on his tombstone and it said this. Consider, young man, as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, soon you shall be. So prepare, young man, to follow me. And that sounds pretty like a resounding, profound thing until one young man read it and he took a nail and he etched the, this on the back of the tombstone. To follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. Amen? Until I know which way you went. Hallelujah. So it's with heavy heart this morning that I preach to you this message. And like I said, I would rather be talking about the glories of heaven. Your mansion there. The fact that there's no sickness, no sorrow, no weeping, no wailing. But I would be neglectful. I would consider it spiritual malpractice, Brother Jim. Yes. If all I ever did was tell you about heaven and never told you about the flames and torment of hell that await all those that reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. The lost need to know this because this is where you will go if you do not accept Jesus. Say, well, my, my brother, he stays home and he watches all them TV preachers on Sunday morning. Well, I guarantee you, you don't hear nothing about hell. Unless he's watching SBN, he don't hear nothing about hell. Amen. I have heard preachers, mega preachers, popular preachers say, well, in our church we've got Muslims. They leave encouraged. Listen, I welcome every Muslim, every homosexual, amen, every, every one of atheists, every one of different beliefs. But I pray that when you come here and you hear the preaching of the gospel, you don't leave feeling wonderful. You leave, if you didn't make it right here, you leave feeling the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, letting you know that you're not right with God amen. because you have your faith in something else and someone else other than Jesus Christ, Amen. They interviewed Muslims and they interviewed atheists and they said, I love going to this man's church because he encourages me. It makes me feel good. I don't want to make you feel good this morning. I want to tell you the truth and then leave it in your hands between you and God what you do with it. Amen? I want you to be encouraged and I want you to feel strengthened and I want you to feel good if you're saved. Amen. If you're living for the Lord. But if you're lost, if you're on your way to hell, I want you to feel miserable this morning until you get things right with God. Amen. I used to pray this for my family, and I probably need to start praying it again. Lord, do whatever it takes and make them as miserable as you have to. Haunt their dreams if you have to until they find a place of repentance and give their heart to you. Amen. Amen. Say, Brother Billy, that's a strong prayer. Yeah, well, hell, yes. hell is going to last forever. Amen. Hallelujah. The lost need to know because that's where they're going to go. The church needs to be reminded of it because there's very little teaching on it. 
I remember reading several years ago, and I'm trying to close. I remember reading several years ago about a Presbyterian minister, and only bring that up because this was he was an, actually a Presbyterian minister. This could be Pentecost or Baptist or whatever Assembly of God. But he he, he was he came in to pastor this church and. Over, I don't know if it was 40 years or however long back it was, but they had kept a record of all of the sermons that pastors had preached in that church. And he said he was startled as he looked back through last year, the year before, the year before, the year before. All of the hundreds of sermons didn't find one that dealt with hell. None. I know we can't preach this every Sunday, but we better preach it. Amen. We better preach it. If I was never going to preach about, if all I was going to tell you was about heaven and about the glories there and about how great it is, and if I was never going to preach to you about hell, I'd take my minister's license out of my pocket and I'd give them to somebody else and say, here, you preach. I'm not fit for it. I'm not fit for the job. I know one preacher not too far from here. He said, you'll never hear me preach against sin and you'll never hear me preach about hell. Because people don't need to hear that and make them feel bad. If they don't know Jesus, if they're on their way to hell, they need to feel bad this morning. They need to feel the convicting power of the Holy Ghost gripping their hearts so tight they can't hardly breathe until Brother Tyler, they find them a place of repentance and say, oh God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Because we're dealing with eternity. Amen? Eternity. Listen to this. Say, preacher, you're trying to scare me. Jude 1 to 23 says, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. I want you to be afraid this morning. This is the only kind of fear I want you to, the only kind of fear that I want you to, be, to experience today, amen, is the fear of knowing if you don't get your heart right with the Lord, you're going to die and split hell wide open and there's no escape from there. And the torments are so many this morning, we won't be able to cover them all because our greatest imagination and the worst thing we can think, or no matter what it comes into our mind, it does not compare to this hell that we're talking about that Jesus described and that these other scriptures described. One might ask this morning, why was hell created? Well, it wasn't created for you. Amen? Listen, Matthew 24 and 40, 25 and 41, you can write that down. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Amen? It's prepared for the devil and his angels. It's not God's will that you go to hell. The Bible says it's his will that all should be saved, that all should not perish but should come to repentance. When Jesus looked at his disciples, he said, I go, to, go away to prepare a place for you. He wasn't talking about hell. He was talking about heaven. But because man's rebellion, because man has rejected God and his way, the old rugged cross, ah, hallelujah, we still preach the cross this morning, amen, as being the only hope for mankind, the finished work that Jesus did there. Man has, hell has enlarged herself and man ends up in hell because he rejected what God, God has done everything except make the choice for you. And that's up to you. Amen. That's up to you. Uh, that's 2 Peter 3 and 9, where that God is not willing that any should perish. Amen. And today, listen, if you're under the sound of my voice, there's still time for you. There's still room at the cross for you. But sadly, there's still room in hell for you as well if you reject him. The Bible says in Proverbs 27 and 20, hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. We've already talked about it a little bit, but you can write these scriptures down. It would do you good to study on hell. Hallelujah might help to get you your burden for the lost. Amen. Stirred up inside of you. Uh, one of the torments there is fire. The Bible's very plain with that. Mark 9 and 43 speaks of hell fire that cannot be quenched. Revelation 20 and 10 says, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. So one of the torments of hell is that it never stops. Amen? And it says that whosoever was not found 
written in the, in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So that lets us know very plainly today that you have to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Say, Brother Billy, is it a literal book? It may very well be, but I know for a fact that it's talking about those that have put their faith in the Lamb of God. Those who have their name written there have put their faith in Him. Those who don't are those who have rejected Him. And those who have rejected Him will spend eternity in the fiery flames of the lake of fire, which is where hell will be tossed in the end. Amen. Revelation 21 and 8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Hell is a place of punishment. Matthew 25 and 46 says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Hell is a place of destruction. Matthew 10 and 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul, soul and body in hell. 2 Thessalonians 1 and 9 lets us know this. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You see, as we will experience eternal life, those that go to hell will experience eternal death. They won't just fade away and be burned up and that's all there is to it. The Bible says they'll be tormented forever, everlasting. So this destruction, and, and it's hard for us to see this because in our mind's eye, if we destroy something, it's gone. But that's not the way the Bible's speaking of it here. It's talking about being destroyed forever and forever and forever. Being burned forever and forever. Dying forever and forever and forever. No relief from it. No relief from it. So it's a place of destruction. It's a place of eternal death. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ our Lord. Sin still pays its debts. Amen? The wages of sin is death. It's a place in Matthew 13 and 50 says it's weep there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It says they shall and, he, and, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's a place of everlasting darkness according to Matthew 25 and 30. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As we said earlier about the rich man that was in hell that could find no comfort. It's a place of no rest. How many people have never been... Have, I know Sister Sharon deals with this because she'll post things on Facebook talking about not being able to get any rest, not being able to get any sleep because of her sickness or because of the things that she has going on that she, that she deals with. Amen. How many people know what it's like not to be able to rest? It's just, and I'm I ain't talking about just one night. I'm not just talking about two nights. I'm not even talking about through what is our life that just really appears for a little while and then vanishes away. I'm talking about forever and forever. No rest. No comfort. Amen. So hell is a place of no rest. Revelation 14, 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. It's a place, according to Mark 9 and 44, where the worm dieth not. That word worm there means maggot. Where the worm dieth not. How many people like, how many people like maggots? It's a place where the worm dieth not. I heard one preacher put it this way. The way that maggots, well, it's pretty gross, the way that maggots will consume a dead corpse, they will gnaw on your body, on your spirit, throughout eternity in the depths of the damned. And, you know, you feel something crawling on you. You're like, get that off. What is that? Think about it. Forever and forever. You feel like you have worms or maggots crawling all over you. And then no matter what you do, you can't get them off. That's a torment in itself. On top of all these other torments. Amen. So preacher, you're scaring me good. If you're not saved, you need to be scared. Amen. It's a place where the worm dieth not. That's Mark 9 and 44. Uh, 
This is what it says in Isaiah 66 and 24. They shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Like I told you, man in his most diabolical, destructive way of thinking could not come up with a haunted house or a house of horrors that compares to the torments of hell. Amen? Amen. And I've told you what's going to get you there, and I've told you what's going to keep you from going and get you to heaven. And that is to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to ask Him to be your Lord and Savior, to forgive you of your sins, to put your faith in the fact that He was crucified for you, that He was buried, that He rose on the third day, and that He is the only Savior of the world, and your only hope of not having to go to this terrible place. Amen? Uh... And I share this with you this morning. And I'm going to let you go. And I know, like I said, I knew before I ever started that I would walk away from this thinking, oh God, I could have done a better job. I could have done more. Because it grieves my heart beyond anything that I've ever thought of to think of souls going to this awful, terrible tormenting place. I read this to you not too long ago. I read it to you again this morning. This is a poem the Lord gave to me. And maybe you can understand. Maybe to give you a little bit of a glimpse into the heart of this preacher. There is a call that haunts my soul. A call that comes from down below. A cry that haunts my dreams at night. A call of pain, of grief and fright. These words so full of hurt and pain they call for me they call my name. They beckon me to tell the lost of sin's great shame and what it cost. To tell them one, to tell them all, to warn them of this fiery fall. These words that haunt me, I must tell. You see, this is a call from hell. Hallelujah. I haven't heard that rich man's cry with my natural ears this morning, but I have heard it in my spirit. Hallelujah. I have heard it in my spirit. Tell him not to come to this awful place. Amen. Amen. And let me say this again to preachers out there that might tune in. If you have no intention of ever preaching about hell, please go do something else. Amen. It'd be better for you and it'd be better for them if you never preached another sermon if you have no intention of warning of the fires of hell. And like I said, you can't preach it every Sunday, but you better preach it. Amen. The good news is that if you're out there on the side of my voice, if you're hearing this on CD or the radio or watching this video, there's still hope and time for you to make things right with God. As a matter of fact, he ordained for you to hear this so that you could make things right with him. Let me close with this. Dr. Harold Smith told this story once of a 14-year-old girl who refused to give her heart to the Lord in a revival meeting that he was preaching. During the invitation time, he said that he felt impressed to the Holy Spirit to extend the altar call. He noticed the young lady was obviously under conviction. Her eyes were filled with tears. She gripped the back of the pew until her knuckles turned white. Even her parents knew that she was under heavy conviction and pled with her to give her heart to the Lord, but to no avail. After the service was concluded, this girl and her family started home in the family car. But not long after leaving the church, their car was struck by another vehicle, overturning it and rupturing the gas tank. Miraculously, the girl's father and mother got out of the vehicle unharmed and crawled out onto the road. But the daughter was pinned in the back seat as she cried for them to get her out. As she screamed for them to get her out. There was a man that stopped by to give them assistance to try and help her to get her out. Tragically, the man who was smoking a cigarette was not aware of the stream of gas that was on the highway from the ruptured gas tank. And he threw down the cigarette which ignited the gasoline which went and ignited the car in flames. And the teenage girl was trapped. And in a flash, the disabled vehicle 
with its one remaining passenger burst into flames and the parents watched in horror as their daughter began to scream in terror and pain. But the heat was so intense they could do nothing to rescue her. They could not get close enough to get her out. And the preacher said strangely that they related to him that in a few moments the girl's screams began to subside. And she quietly began to plead, Daddy, Mommy, please help me. Uh, he said he remembered the daughter's conviction in the service earlier that night. The mother, the mother remembered how that she gripped the back of the pew and she didn't go to the Lord. And the only thing that her mother could do was to scream and to beg for her to accept Jesus. And the voice from inside the flame said, Mommy, I want to, but I can't because now it's too late for me. Those were the last words that she heard from her daughter from the midst of the flames. It's too late for countless millions today, billions that have died and went to hell, but it's not too late for you as long as there is breath in your body, there is time for you to call out on Jesus Christ. If you're out there under the sound of my voice and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and something that this pitiful excuse for a preacher has said to you today has caused you to think about your eternal destination, I invite you right now, don't wait. Don't say, well, I'll think about it, preacher. I'll do it tomorrow because none of us are promised tomorrow. Turn to Jesus today and accept him as Lord and Savior and put your faith and your trust in him. Hey, preacher, I don't know how to be saved. The church complicates it. God made it easy. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just say, Lord Jesus, save me. Come into my heart and my life. Forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and Savior, and he will do that. And you won't have to go to this terrible house of horrors that we have talked about this morning. Hallelujah. It would behoove us all this morning, church, to make sure that we spend time praying for the lost. For our lost loved ones. For our lost friends. And for all of those that are lost, and even though you don't know them, they're still going to spend eternity in hell unless they turn to Jesus, and they may not have nobody praying for them. Amen. Hallelujah. So I ask you this morning, church, to remember that when you pray. Pray for the lost. Pray for the lost today. That they would accept Jesus before it's eternally too late. And do what you can do. Give what you can give. Pray while you can pray. Amen. Be a part of the work of God in any way whatsoever that you can. Because there are souls that hang in the balance today in eternity. Heaven and hell is forever and forever. You're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, wow, he's went on a long time. Just a drop in the bucket. Not even a drop in the bucket to the time that the rich man that we started this sermon talking about has been in hell. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Lord, give us a burden for the lost like we've never had before. And we will work while it is day, for night is soon coming. Lord, help us to be the light that we're supposed to be. Help us to be the witness that we're supposed to be. Lord, help us to be the prayer warrior that we're supposed to be. Help us, Lord, to make a difference in someone's life. Lord, to set up a roadblock between them and hell. Hallelujah. I like what Charles Spurgeon said, and I, I didn't have it down this morning, so I won't get it right. But He said, if they go to hell, let them go to hell, leaping over our screaming bodies, warning them not to go. Amen. Hallelujah. Someone else this morning have something before we go.